What's up, guys? Now, this right now is the week that we are normally all gathered together celebrating aviation with all of our friends and checking out all the cool airplanes as well as all the cool components that are all set up to check out at Oshkosh. Now my friends over at Garmin asked me if I'd be interested in doing a video about the avionics in my plane as part of their virtual Oshkosh because, you know, we really don't talk about avionics that much when it comes to bush or stole or backcountry type aircraft. So what I figure I'd do, let's go for a standard flight, start to finish. I'm gonna show you guys how I use the G3X in my type of operations and tell you guys how it kind of has changed my mind when it comes to uh, higher end or fancy avionics in stole or bush planes. I'm Trent Palmer. I fly drones for a living and bush planes for fun. Follow along as I journey off the beaten path of aviation. show you guys what's going on on the G3X. I'll go ahead and hit record on that so you can see how I work this thing kind of start to finish. Zero, one Zulu. Wind, three, zero, zero. At three knots, visibility more than one zero. Sky condition, clear below one, two thousand. Temperature, one, three Celsius. Dew point, minus one Celsius. Altimeter, three, zero. One zero inches of mercury. So I've shown you guys this feature before, but basically since the G3X allows a external video input, I just have a little tiny like, you know, rear view camera from a car mounted under my cowling up on the front. So I can see what's in front of me with the tall uh, landing gear and the big tires. It kind of leaves me blind with my tails down on the ground. Obviously it's not an issue at flight attitude, but on the ground makes it a little hard to see in front of you. So having that front view camera is just a nice feature. Another cool thing, and this is pretty obvious, I know a lot of them do this, but it does overlay your airport diagram so that you can see all your taxiways as well as FBOs and where the fuel is. The whole nine. It's the traffic, Freedom Fox uh, lining up on runway 32, we'll be straight out northbound. And we'll go back to the map page, zoom out. That traffic, Skyhawk 670 Charlie Sierra is upwind of 32, and be advised there were a few little birds on the runway. Roger that, thank you. And there's pattern altitude. That traffic, Skyhawk 670 Charlie Sierra, right downwind, 32, dead. I got them on ADSB. Doesn't look like there's anyone else. Man, look at all my tracks. So I do have to preface this entire talk by telling you guys that I used to be a bit of a naysayer when it came to fancy or glass avionics in a stole or backcountry style airplane. I've just always been of the mentality that less is more, keep it light, keep it simple, keep your eyes outside the plane, which I still do believe in. And uh, it's funny that now after flying this setup for almost two years, I've realized that this allows you to do that actually just more effectively. The traffic Skyhawk 670 Charlie Sierra, right base 32 touch and go dead. I'm gonna switch frequencies. Obviously flying in the stole or bush or backcountry environment is gonna have some unique challenges that aren't there with uh, normal scopes of flying. Obviously we're flying oftentimes in the terrain instead of over the terrain. We're in remote areas where there really isn't any weather observations available. So the more information you can have in your cockpit, right at your fingertips, the better. So my setup is the Garmin G3X, which was originally experimental only. Now it is uh, TSO'd for a bunch of certified aircraft, but basically it's their 10 plus inch touchscreen display that's an all-in-one. It's your PFD, MFD, EIS, everything in one unit, and I'm utilizing almost exclusively all their remote mount modules. So my uh, radio is all ran through the G3X, my transponders all through the G3X. I don't have any other panel mount modules aside from the actual autopilot control unit just because we wanted to be able to jump up here and hit like the level button in case anything were to go wrong. And again, you know, an autopilot is one of those things that I kind of naysayed for a while because I said that's silly, you know, quit pushing buttons and fly your dang airplane, stick and rudder airplane. But at the same time, now having had it for a little bit, I will say, 
it's kind of a huge safety feature. Uh, God forbid if for any reason I was flying with Haley and I became, you know, unable to fly the airplane because I, you know, I don't know, some health concern or whatever be it, she could put the level button, sit here, have a little time to figure things out, get me back to it. The other thing too, uh, you know, with doing a lot of the photo and video missions that we do, it's nice for me to be able to hit level. I can play with my camera, have people come up, fly near me, as long as I'm high and away from things, I can do that in a relatively safe manner. That's not recommended. There's a lot of task saturation there, but I will admit I've done that from time to time. Also, God forbid you end up flying into IMC, which I will do pretty much anything to avoid IMC. Having the autopilot is a pretty good feature, safety feature in that instance. Also the autopilot, I think overall added like sub five pounds to the whole airplane. So it was worthwhile. Now I'm not gonna go into every single feature of the G3X because this would be like a two hour long video. Garmin has plenty of uh, information out there on these things. I just wanted to show you guys how I use it in a stolen environment. I did recently just add Garmin's enhanced topo maps, which are pretty awesome. Basically it gives you a super detailed topo image of the terrain also shows all the landmarks so it'll give you peak names as well as canyon names creek names all of that so if you're trying to link up with uh you know friends on the ground or if you're someone that's a hunter that's just going out and scouting out locations it's awesome to have all of that on your display also for when you're flying in the terrain like i talked about having more information at your fingertips is always better obviously there is the terrain section of this uh of the g3x but it's not quite as accurate. It basically is gonna tell you what you're gonna hit. And also you can look at your sectional overlays, which works great too, but it's not nearly as detailed uh, when it comes to topo maps as this topo overlay. All right, I'm gonna drop into a place we call Rocky Meadow, and I'm gonna show you guys uh, what I would do and how I utilize the G3X, at least on my uh, approach and, and entry to landing. So right now I'm seeing that there's three miles an hour still out of the north, northwest, which is basically calm. But it's nice having that information. Another great piece of information that you get on the G3X, if I go to data fields, I can see what my density altitude is. So knowing that my GPS altitude right now is just shy of 6,500 feet, density altitude is 1,100 feet above that. So, so I can pretty safely say that since I know I'm landing at 5,500 feet over here, the density altitude is probably 6,600 with that same 1,100 foot adjustment from temperature and pressure which again, anyone that flies knows density altitude can be a killer, honestly. So knowing your density altitude when you're going into a strip like this is great to have right at your fingertips. Obviously the, the main screen on here is gonna have all your primary flight information being airspeed, altitude, attitude, heading, turn coordinator, all the main stuff. But it also does have angle of attack through its uh, you know, dual port pitot tube. Now the AOA, which you guys probably hear in a lot of my videos, that it's that beeping when I'm coming in and landing. It's the angle of attack telling me I'm getting nearer and nearer to a critical angle of attack or stall. It's done through Garmin's little dual way pitot. Basically it's got two holes in the pitot tube and it judges the pressure differential between those two to tell the angle of the airplane. I found it to be super accurate. The main use I have for it is just, again, awareness and kind of being that little tap on the shoulder. If you were to be, you know, circling low, inspecting a landing spot and accidentally get too slow, that's gonna just be that little guy tapping on your shoulder saying, hey dude, uh, push that nose down, don't keep pulling up, you're getting a little close to stall there. It's also nice for setting a very stabilized approach. You can just uh, actually set the bug where you want it in the calibration so you know when I'm on final, I should be sitting right on that line. I'll show you how, how that looks. All right, so what you're seeing right there is my AOA gauge. That little green dot is my steepest and best stole approach. So that's what you aim for. Oftentimes I'm a little fast for that because here I am right just uh, juggling the difference between 49 and 50 miles an hour. But this puts me on a really steep, stable approach, also very slow into this. Look at that, the wind direction has swapped 180 degrees. It is now at seven miles an hour. So that beeping you're hearing is the AOA, starting to tell me you're getting close to stall, and then I'm down on the ground. And then again, front view camera, let me see where all those rocks are so I'm not just blindly taxiing into a rock or a bush. All right, we are gonna blast on out of here. Obviously, 
I'd make a radio call, but there is no uh, traffic advisory frequency for little random remote fields that we've landed in. And we are back off. Another thing I should mention, I'm sure you guys noticed that I have a separate engine monitoring gauge. And the reason I'm doing that is because of the the single lever constant speed prop being that I have a constant speed propeller on here that's ran all through this stock box that makes it, I think, basically a FADEC engine because it does have full authority of the prop and everything. And because I do have that stock box, I am not running any of my engine information into the G3X, although there is a new version of the stock box that will feed the CAN bus out into the G3X, and the G3X does play with all the, the Rotax uh, CAN bus, you know, injected smart engines. It has all that information. It has a very, very good engine monitoring system with audio alerts and everything. Again, one of the things I love about this setup is with the audio alerts, you don't need to be looking at your, your panel all the time. It will remind you to the little tap on the shoulder with a chime, be it whether it's your AOA or any other anomaly, it's going to tell you what's going on. Also, obviously, with the synthetic vision, just helps keep your awareness. If uh, you know, you're know you flying at night or limited visibility, you're going to be able to see where everything is around you. It's going to overlay what uh, is close to you, where, where terrain is going to become an issue. And here I am in the terrain, like I say. Put myself in a canyon like this, I can easily look through on the topo and say, okay, there's no random close out. This is not a box canyon. I'm not going to be able to get out of that. In addition to the synthetic vision, just adds more awareness to you. You know, in addition to the topo overlay, I've also got traffic and weather overlays turned on, which is really nice. I love this canyon. This connects from, I don't actually even know what that canyon is behind me, but it's calling this dry valley and I'll, I'll buy that wildcat hill up off our left. Again, having the names of everything super handy when we're uh, flying with other planes, trying to orient where you are, or if you're going to meet buddies ground-based, or again, someone that's out hunting. Perfect to be able to uh, kind of aerial scout and know what locations you're looking at. So before this setup, I basically had pretty much basic steam gauges or analog instruments. I also had that little, uh, I think it was a Dynon six-in-one kind of attitude unit, which worked well. And then for navigation, I just used my iPad with an app on it and then a standalone GPS. That setup worked great. You know, I was, I was pretty happy with it. I did run into some issues from time to time with it overheating either the GPS or the iPad itself that I was running. Also keeping them charged was always funky. And for some reason, a lot of power adapters for planes to charge mobile devices, when you plug those in, it adds noise to your intercom so that you end up with all this headset noise that's not ideal. So getting rid of all that was a pretty nice thing. And quite honestly, flight planning on the G3X is probably just as easy as on a, a mobile app, on an iPad, or on a phone. The cool thing though, with the G3X, because it does have Bluetooth, you can flight plan on your phone or on your iPad and then just send that flight plan up to your G3X. So basically when I'm on cross country trips, I'll flight plan when we're you know either at camp or at the hotel or wherever we're staying. And then I'll go ahead and just send that over to the G3X, have that on screen ready to go. Again, it's just nice having everything at your fingertips. There's no more fumbling around, going between different avionics, trying to get everything to play together. It's all in one. And as far as I know, I think the setup pretty much does everything. I'm sure there might be a feature or two it lacks, but I'm not really aware of what those features are. I'm trying to think of downsides. It seems unfair to just talk about all the good stuff of the G3X without talking about the downsides. I guess, uh, one of them obviously would be price. It, if you already have an airplane with avionics and you want to upgrade to the G3X, it's more expensive than not upgrading avionics. Uh, that said, I think whenever you kind of talk about price with anything in life, you really need to consider value. So how much you're getting for that price. And that's where the G3X is kind of hard to beat because for the price, you know, it might be slightly more expensive than some of the other uh, options out there as far as kind of the digital panels that are available for experimental aircraft. The difference being the G3X, I believe, has more features than you're gonna find in any other unit like this. And another big thing, at least to me, is that Garmin has been making certified avionics for years. Uh, their experimental side is gonna be built using the exact same parts, same hardware, same innards, and you know, for a device like this that gets certified, 
Uh, you're getting a full certified avionic, which is built at a higher quality than some of the other competitors are. Every fitting is made to FAA standards. Everything's the highest of quality, which to me is important when you're uh, depending on essentially one device to kind of run everything in your plane. It's good to know that they're built well. So I am doing an approach to what we call GOATS. This one's a sporty one. It's kind of side hill turning uphill landing. You kind of land as if you're banking a berm, like on a dirt bike, which is super fun. But anyone that uh, comes in here their first time as a passenger is like, what are you doing? You can't land here. But so put it in a turn. Oh, I'll do a little bounce, land on the backside and just roll up to the other peak. That one is honestly <laughs> probably one of the more fun spots to land still because it comes up quick and it feels like it's gonna be like extremely short. And because of the, the hill to it um, and the fact that it's just the sight picture, it's actually a little longer than it looks. It's probably, you know, a good 400 feet. So plenty of room. I'm at 5,500. It's gonna get out, but I think we should keep flying. So taking off from here is probably just as fun as the landing. I don't do the turning thing because that would put me into rising terrain. So there's two little like bumps on this actual hill and the saddle between I basically use as like a transition into a lip. So I turn it into a little ski jump, jump off. And because it drops off so much, even if you aren't fast enough, you know, you kind of go over the bump and push your nose over. It's like a little roller coaster ride, which makes it pretty fun. So just lift the tail so I can see where I'm going. And then here's the jump portion and off. <laughs> so much fun. And again, I don't think those cameras ever do it any justice. This lake bed over here, I have not seen dry in years and it looks dry. I think we'll go drag a wheel on it and see how dry it actually is. Another thing has to do with awareness, has nothing to do with avionics. Dry lake beds. We've always said dark is danger. That's kind of the, the you know, standard look of mud, but something to be aware of is that some of these lake beds will get a little salt layer on the top that kind of crystallizes and hardens, but it's just sitting on basically endless deep slimy mud. So you have to be really careful with some of these lake beds that you aren't super familiar with to find out how hard they really are. So what I'll do on something like this, I'm just looking at it. I'm not seeing any uh, indication that it's soft, but I'll put one wheel down, sometimes two, whatever you're comfortable with, and just keep up to speed, feel for it, and see if it's trying to grab and, you know, put your uh, nose over. Got an antelope running with me over there, which is kind of cool. But basically doing a, a little drag on it, running your wheels is a good way to analyze. But honestly, with a lot of these uh, lake beds, don't let your guard down. I know that they're like the easiest place to land but I've seen it bite a few of my friends, so just be aware. But yeah, that one felt good. I might turn around and actually put it down on that, then blast out. There's a fun canyon to rip going that way. This will be a fun approach. I've got a little canyon right here that I can put myself in that'll force me to tighten up this pattern. So let's get it nice and slow. Choose this canyon. Can't even see it. It's kind of like just one little notch before the next hill. Keep it nice and slow and relatively steep. That's one thing, this constant speed prop, if you pull it all the way back, man, this thing, it's like hitting the brakes. Uh, but I also run out of elevator authority because it kind of blankets the tail. So I kind of go to the neutral thrust, which is a little bit of throttle in to keep as much elevator authority as I can. And here we are. Turning final. Do you have the AOA beeping at me, telling me I'm getting slow. And I'll re-trim for takeoff. I do always land full aft trim or full nose up trim. Take off full nose down trim, help the tail get up. Under higher throttle settings, the plane likes to have more forward trim than aft trim, so. That's why I'll set that for takeoff. Also, the flaps on this thing, when you pull flaps, it actually pushes the nose down. I know a lot of aircraft, when you pull flaps, it pulls the nose up. Kit Fox doesn't do that, it does the opposite. So anyway, let's go ahead and blast off out of here.
I love looking at the little squiggles of all the times I've been in and out of goats and all the other stuff I've been doing out just in this one little canyon. So I'm trying to think of what else I can tell you guys about avionics in my uh, little stole kit fox. Call it a bush plane, call it a backcountry plane, call it whatever you want to call it. Again, I'm a huge believer of just flying with your eyes outside your plane. So having something that isn't requiring much of your attention, that doesn't leave you task saturated, that is as easy as humanly possible, that gives you all the information that's humanly possible, is absolutely crucial to me. Um, I'll go ahead and show you guys the flight planning side. So for me, if I'm gonna head back to Stead, I'm gonna go ahead and go to Direct 2. We'll just go nearest airports and there's KRTS Reno Stead. I'll go activate. There it is, it's on there. If I want, I can go ahead and turn the autopilot on and turn it to nav. And now it's gonna go ahead and put it on heading. I could tell it to altitude, hold where we're at, and it's gonna level us off and head straight into Stead for us. The other nice thing with the radio as well, when I am searching for frequencies, I can tap on the radio icon, hit find, I can go on our flight plan, select from Stead, check the AWOS, highlight that and be getting the AWOS right there. Again, when I need the CTAF, I can go to select frequency, go to Unicom, Unicom which is CTAF, have it there. Also very easy to monitor, transferring, you can either tap up there, tap down below at the expert button. But basically everything's super fast, super easy. I'm not spending a bunch of time fiddling with avionics, fiddling with the radio. It's all done, super streamlined right there in the G3X. So I think I'm gonna let this thing go ahead and fly me home. I'm probably gonna wrap this one up here. I don't wanna ramble on any longer. I know this was a lot more talking than I normally do. Uh, but again, I think it was fun and in the spirit of Oshkosh and kind of nerding out on some of the aviation stuff, which is part of the fun of that event. I figured this would be a worthwhile thing to do. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You guys know the drill. Like this video if you do. Subscribe if you haven't. Come be my wingman. See you on the next one.